Hey, I like that a lot. Well, <laughs> welcome everybody to the two o'clock to 250 panel presentation on best practices in virtual mentorship from the classroom to the boardroom. And we're welcoming today our presenters, or I guess panelists, I really should say, which are Dr. J Dr. Jonna Myers and Dr. Amanda Everett from Southwestern Oklahoma State University. And we're joined by a student from Southwestern Oklahoma State University, Mr. Robert Williams. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you three. I'm here to answer any questions uh, that you all may need, help out in any way, and also let you know if the audience has any questions for you. So thank you very much for being here. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We are really excited to share some things with you. Um, I will tell you on behalf of Dr. Everett and myself, we are um, social constructivists. So please interrupt us at any time, ask questions, throw in experiences that you've had. Um, we really would love for this to be more of a conversation. So with that being said, uh, we want to talk you guys through what we have found to be some best practices in virtual mentorship. Okay, now I know we have all been doing this whole Zoom thing for a while, and you would think by now we would all be really great at this. And if you have been in this room for the last 10 minutes, you have watched us finagle cameras and microphones and try to figure out what it is that we're not doing right. And so there seems to be this really interesting assumption uh, happening right now where we don't have to say we're living in a new normal. Everyone understands that to be true in a post-COVID world, yet the changes that were brought about as a result of this new normal, uh, we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, and even if you look at the scholarship in areas like virtual management or uh, remote mentorship, it's lacking. Um, we are still trying to figure out how to do this whole digital world thing well. Um, and so I would set the premise for this conversation by saying, um, obviously we have a new normal, but I don't know that we've quite figured out how we're going to thrive in this, in this new normal. So that's kind of some things we'd like to talk about today. Robert, does your microphone work? I should have asked you earlier if it, if you're able to speak. No, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure my microphone is working okay. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, Good job, good. Robert. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, one of the sort of uh, misconceptions that has arisen before because of COVID-19 is that uh, telework is sort of this new invention. It's this new thing that everyone has just started doing. But uh, we were already transitioning to these remote work environments even before the pandemic. The only thing is the pandemic forced that shift to happen a lot more rapidly than it was happening before. And uh, basically the biggest uh, things that we're facing is workers feel a lot more isolated and a lot of the research urges leaders to overcome worker isolation by basically using the technologies at their disposal better, using technology to make deadlines and goals more clear and to make work more feasible for the workers. And uh, yeah, and one of the things that is really emphasized in these studies on remote work and leadership is that because we are having workers exist in an isolated environment from their leader or their boss or whoever might be managing them, uh, communication can sometimes break down. So a lot of the research really says that you need to communicate more, not less in digital environments, just because those sorts of communications are more likely to happen. And whenever those miscommunications happen too much, you can actually really increase the stress of workers. And uh, right now, a lot of the research that deals with digital leadership, they try to use uh, leadership styles and theories that we're already familiar with and that have already been researched. So uh, some researchers, uh, they uh, recommend an approach to leadership which combines different styles, like say a transactional style of leadership, the sort of uh, carrot and stick approach where uh, you have 
punishments if you don't meet a goal. And if you do meet a goal, you are rewarded for it. Or uh, even transformational leadership, which involves basically getting involved and leading through example and uh, yeah, showing workers how to lead through example. But uh, basically, what all this research, research is saying is that the current leadership styles we have aren't enough to deal with this new environment, and we basically need to invent a new digital form of leadership. Fantastic. Robert, that was so good. So Robert is a senior English major, going to be graduating in about two and a half weeks. Um, he, he's, I know, it's very sad. <laughs> And uh, we've talked a little bit about how you really can't leave our research team because that won't work. Um, but he's been working with us for two years on several different research projects. Um, and part of what we've done with Robert is that we have found really timely issues. And Robert, as an English major, has done a beautiful job of helping us with our literature reviews. And then what we do is we take these topics and then we actually bring them into our classroom. And so at the end of this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about how we took everything that we have learned and discussed about um, this whole idea of remote mentorship and really applying it. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy to think about that our textbooks don't tell us how to teach this. You know, it's 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 interesting because you could say, oh, well, this is a post-COVID situation, but it's not really, right? You know, for the last 10, 15 years, there's been lots of remote work done, but we don't really have a great way of teaching um, students, how do they engage in uh, remote and digital leadership? Um, with that said, it's kind of interesting to think of it about what does the future look like? Uh, one of the really interesting studies that we found is actually put out by the McKinsey Group, and it's this idea of how many um, employees out there really do want to have more work from home opportunities. And so more than 50% of employees would like to work from home more than three or more days a week. And so it's this phenomenon of um, will we put the genie back in the bottle? It, it doesn't look like it. it. It looks like more and more employees are going to want to have at least some opportunities to work from home. Um, and in our current labor market, there aren't enough humans for all the wonderful jobs. And so uh, we're seeing more and more corporations decide that that could be the competitive advantage, right? I can offer more money, but at the same point, everybody's offering more money. Maybe the thing that I'm offering is work-life balance. And so high probability that we're going to see more and more of this, especially as Gen Z um, gets into the workforce. So this is kind of an interesting chart to get us started on the rest of this discussion. This next one, Robert actually brought this to our team and, and added it to his literature review, is this idea of techno stress. And so it's really interesting to think that the term techno stress was really coined in 1984. Right. Little did they know. How did they know? <laughs> um, but this whole idea that it, it is, it's tough. It's, it's tough to keep up with all the technology changes. It's tough to keep up with all the um, opportunities. Uh, something really interesting is this 2020 study talked a little bit about how uh, certain groups of workers are impacted by this. Uh, one of my favorites is workers with a tendency towards workaholism are more likely to be susceptible from, to techno stress, which Probably if you are in this meeting, that's probably you, right? Um, especially, you know, it's the end of the semester. There's so many other things to do. And then you're also here. So I'm guessing, you know, I ought not diagnosed, but I'm guessing that a lot of us in this uh, Zoom room have experienced that. And then this overloading of technology and the blurring of boundaries between work and private life. Um, how many of us are answering emails? all the time. Um, and so that was kind of an interesting thing to be considering too, as we're discussing this idea of digital mentorship. Uh, because uh, Dr. Myers and I are business professors, it only seems right to show you some of these publications that are coming out uh, in the business world. Uh, Forbes, um, Harvard, lots of different publications out there are talking about how does uh, leadership and mentorship work in the hybrid world? Um, you're probably not going to be wildly surprised by this statistic. And I see lots of different statistics, but they're always incredibly high. This whole idea that like 85% of employees worldwide are either not engaged or actively disengaged at work. 
right? So we know we have a problem. Uh, we know we have a problem where people are staying in their employment shorter and shorter amounts of time. Um, lots of positions are remaining open. And so uh, one really cool thing that this Forbes article does is it talks a little bit about, okay, so, so what's next? What can we do next? Um, one of the ideas is to meet mentees where they are and provide them equal attention and opportunities regardless of location. Um, you know, as those of you that have managed people before, this is tough. I, I always tell this embarrassing story about myself. I got a management position way before I was actually ready to be a manager, partially just because sometimes I'm a workhorse and I get a lot of things done. So they made me in charge because they wanted lots of things done. But with that, I, I, at that point, probably still a little bit now, very task-oriented human. And so very task-oriented manager. If I went into, in the hallway, I would offer some consideration, some support, ask how you're doing. But if I didn't run into you, I may or may not have done a really great job of being a mentor and a good support system. Well, in a digital world, are we going to accidentally run into each other? Um, it's embarrassing to admit that my first management position, I actually put it on my calendar. Uh, these are the times of day when I'm going to accidentally run into people by taking trips around the building that I may or may not have needed to do. I, so what does that look like now that we're in a digital world? How do we make sure that that's still happening? Uh, the other part was this whole idea of digital mentorship and unattended consequences of self-censorship. How many of us go to Zoom meetings and we listen and we don't engage? Um, this is going to be especially hard for our new graduates realize that they have been in Zoom meetings for the last three and a half years where they got lectured to. And so they, their whole experience of Zoom is sitting quietly and waiting for it to be over. <laughs> and even those of us that are in a professional setting might also have that experience. Like it's, it's really easy face to face to tell Dr. Myers, hey, I didn't like that. Or, hey, that was really cool. Whereas in Zoom, it just feels a lot safer to sit quietly and, and, and wait, and then you wait, and then the moment passes and you don't necessarily share whatever the issue is. Other things that they talked about was purposefully engaging, um, making sure that you have online and in-person elements, and making sure that it's unique to the mentee. Um, you know, a lot of times we try to be fair, we try to be fair. And so, but if we're trying to be fair, that, that really is just offering everybody the exact same mentor mentee experience and those of us that have had brilliant mentors know that, that, that that's not how it works you know um really it's it's very much a one-on-one -on -one relationship this next one i think is fascinating too so this is actually put out by a harvard business review um and big thing that they talk about in this article is the importance of building rapport and so how important is the first five minutes of the meeting where people just come in and visit with each other Right? Do we leave space for that? Um, something that I've experienced in Zoom meetings is a lot of times because it's on Zoom, uh, we're at home. Let's get in, get the meeting accomplished, and move on with the rest of our lives, which I respect so much because I really just want to get things done. Um, but it is the absolute opposite of what we need for good mentor relationships. Um, ditch the uh, happy hours. You know, we have all these big Zoom meetings. Um, one of my classes, I actually require students to go to virtual networking events. And I had a student that signed up for one where there were 150 participants. All right, so this whole idea of happy hours in Zoom and with our current technology, not, not going to work. Um, multiple modalities, benchmarks and celebrating wins. I think that's also something that we kind of struggle with in Zoom. Right. If I walk by you in the hallway three or four times during a week, I'd be like, oh, hey, I saw that thing you did. That was awesome. Um, but in a Zoom or online or even email, sometimes that's lost. Um, organizational values and grounding, all of what we're doing in those is, of course, important. Consistency and structure. You know, it, it seems silly to set in your calendar, hey, I need to reach out to these people three or four times for an impromptu opportunity to talk to each other. But if it's not going to happen, it has to be scheduled. And then also this idea of collaborating in real time, which I think is going to be incredibly difficult for a lot of students who are new graduates, because sadly, you know, most of their teachers, Zoom just became another way of lecturing and not really teaching them how to collaborate well online. <laughs> this is a fascinating book. Uh, it is actually written by somebody in the K-12 realm, but I would 
suggest you check it out. Um, there's seven different areas here, but probably the two I want to talk about most is this high idea of public relations. Um, mentors becoming the storytellers in chief. Uh, if we are digital and virtual, we have to get even better at telling our story. It has to be faster, it has more, to be more engaging. Um, I often tease my students, you know, face to face, we expect things to be boring. But if it's digital, right, we watch so much YouTube and Netflix and Hulu, it's supposed to be entertaining, right? It's supposed to be to the point and interactive in a way that we don't even expect that from face-to-face -face interactions. The other one that I really liked in this book is this idea of branding. Um, I'm a marketing professor, so of course I like branding. But it's this whole idea that we are engaging an employer in branding and really building a sense of community that is so much more than just having the, the correct background and being branded in our shirts, but actually forming a community. Um, how about let's go to the next one so I don't take up too much time. So what did we do? Uh, Dr. Myers and I have gotten really good about uh, every semester we look and see what is the big issue and then talk about, okay, how are we teaching it in our classrooms and how could we do better? And so this semester, Dr. Myers teaches a HR class and I teach an intro to business class. And we talked about the idea, wouldn't it be interesting if our students had the opportunity to participate in digital mentorship? So this particular class uh, in the picture is my intro to business course. I'm not purposely wearing the same clothes. I do have other clothes. I don't know how, how or why that happened. Uh, but uh, what we did on uh, this day is that the students had the opportunity to identify problems in Weatherford, Oklahoma, and pitch them to the mayor. And so you can see in the picture, we have Mayor Brown and then the economic developer for uh, Weatherford. And say so they wrote these proposals, but before they had the opportunity to pitch them to the mayor, they had to, uh, the chance to submit these to their digital mentors. And those digital mentors were upperclassmen in Dr. Myers's class. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of a taste of how they responded to this experience. All right, so this is what the intro business students said about having digital mentors. Um, each team submitted their papers and each of their papers had at least two different mentorship teams that then created a video um, where they went through their proposal with them and talked about you know what were some of the strengths what were some of the opportunities for improvement um, when doing an analysis of the students reflections so the intro to business students wrote reflection of uh, papers about the experience these were the big themes that kept coming up um, the idea that they really appreciated confidence um, it was interesting, they wrote this in the paper and then actually uh, the next class period, we talked a little bit about face-to-face. -face. It's really uncomfortable when it's wishy-washy on online, right? If you say, you could maybe do this, you could possibly do this, you might wanna think about this. Face-to-face, -face, it's easier to dialogue back and forth. Whereas if it's virtual, the conversation is harder. And so they appreciated it more when they said, this would be a really good idea because. Um, the other thing was additional information. They always appreciated it when rather than saying you should fix that, they said you you might want to consider fixing that because of X, Y, Z. And here are the additional resources that you would need to do that. Um, compliment sandwich. Even 19 year olds know that they want their mentors uh, to give them a compliment sandwich where it's a positive thing. It's an opportunity for improvement and it's another reassuring comment. Um, voice inflection and facial expressions. This came up in every single reflection. There was a lot of conversation about the fact that when it's on Zoom or digital, you really do need to make sure that it is because it is incredibly hard on video to listen to people that aren't animated. Um, and it, it's, it's just a bizarre human quirk that we're, we're willing to do it when we're sitting across from somebody. But you know, on Zoom, I have all these emails, I have all this stuff I should be grading, I have all these other things to do. And so if it's not highly engaging, over the top um, interactions, people are just gonna zone out. Uh, pauses. This is something that we didn't find in any of our literature and I hadn't really thought about. But if I'm working with you face-to-face -face and I'm giving you feedback, I can see when you need me to pause so you can take more notes. Whereas right now, you might all be taking notes and I have no idea. And so I'm just talking as fast as humanly possible and trying to get through all my slides so we don't run out of time. Right? It's just a completely different experience. And so the idea that mentors have to slow down and be more energetic and animated and also be more direct with their language is really kind of an interesting thing. Um, 
And then clutter and noise-free environments. Uh, this was one that I didn't expect either, and it didn't come up in our literature review, is that if you come to my office and it's a mess, it's okay, you, you, can, you can probably tune that out. Um, if there's a loud noise, we're both hearing it, so we're both annoyed, and so we're, we're tuning it out. But my students talked about how online that's incredibly difficult because it's so easy to get distracted by the barking dog or the, the wilted looking house plants. And so believe it or not, it would appear that digitally we are easier to distract. And so that was part of what my intro to business students said about their experience. Now, Dr. Myers is going to talk to you a little bit about the experience of the upperclassmen. This was a super fun project. Um, I had a obviously a different vantage point than Dr. Everett because I was working with students who are primarily seniors, many of whom will be starting their careers in less than a month. And so these young adults are in a really interesting time of their lives. Uh, they are not just dealing with homework, but they are buying a house and starting a career and asking their girlfriend to marry them. I mean, they have these huge life things going on. Um, and so this particular project was really fun for a lot of reasons, uh, but I think just talking about mentorship uh, for them was a really uh, eye-opening experience about how few mentors most of us have ever actually experienced and how we get to decide from the front end of our career if we will take something like mentorship seriously. Uh, and so I think this instilled in these students a value that maybe had not been there before. Uh, but I'll tell you some themes that emerged uh, when I looked at the different reflection prompts that these students had, had given back to me. Um, one interesting thing that first jumped out at me was earlier in the semester when I kind of previewed this assignment for my students and told them, we're going to evaluate these proposals, we're going to make videos, they kind of blew me off. It was like, okay, yeah, we'll make whatever videos, it's no big deal. They were not uh, nervous or intimidated by the idea of giving feedback in a digital medium, and that is their world, right? Everything happens on that four by six iPhone screen. And so um, they they experienced very little um, care or concern early in the semester for what, why would this matter? How would they do it well? As it got closer to time to make those videos um, and it became more real for them, the apprehension kind of set in. And it's so funny, um, you know, your students have different personalities but my type A folks were like, what am I supposed to say? I, you want me to just make feedback and then just give it to them? Like, who's going to read it first? Someone needs to proofread. I mean, it was, they, they were really nervous about it. Um, to put students in a managerial type setting where they are giving real feedback uh, caused a lot of anxiety in them, which they can now look back and see is really helpful. Uh, but in the moment was very much a disorienting dilemma. I mean, that was an uncomfortable place for them to be. <clears throat> um, we found something called negativity avoidance, or that's what I'll call it. Um, Dr. Everett talked about how her students appreciated confidence and clarity in language. I think my students intentionally avoided it for fear of creating confrontation or hurting someone's feelings. And even though it was not a face-to-face real-time conversation, they did not want to be the ones to say, this proposal is awful. I can't believe you're gonna pitch this to the mayor. They, they really, um, they were really nervous about that. And so we had a lot of conversations about the compliment sandwich. How can we empower people, but also tell them the truth about what is good and what is bad if you have had a mentor, you have experienced difficult conversations, right? With them challenging you to think about something in a new way. Um, and so I think they left this experience understanding the importance of concrete language and recognizing that it is um, a truly caring and compassionate act to say hard things to someone, um, which is something I'm still working on in my 30s. Okay. Um, some other things, uh, digital environments and planning. Before my kiddos ever read feedback from the freshmen, they knew that the environments in which they had recorded their feedback was too chaotic. In the moment, they did not feel that. But when they went back and watched, they recognized, okay, I'm going to have to put more time into thinking about what I'm wearing. 
and who's behind me and what what potential noises or distractions could pop up. And so I'm grateful that they recognize those things now instead of in their first virtual job interview. <clears throat> I will tell you on the back end of this project, and if you've done big projects with students, you've experienced this, right? The post-project euphoria of, I did not think I could do this a month ago and I didn't wanna do it and I thought it was terrible. And then they get on the backside and recognize, hey, I did a pretty good job on that. In fact, um, one of the neatest pieces of this assignment, and I was just looking at some of these reflections this morning, uh, I have a student who is wonderful. She's brilliant, articulate. Uh, she will be very successful, but she is not the first person you notice in the room. She is incredibly quiet. Um, she is not a standout. Um, she prefers writing. She prefers working by herself. The act of making a video where she was giving someone real feedback on a project was incredibly intimidating to her. However, after seeing the feedback from the freshmen, her video was most people's favorites because she put a lot of time into it and, uh, and really took it seriously. Her confidence in her ability to speak up and say hard things, she is now walking into a new career with a, I did that mentality. And if that's not the purpose of college, I don't know what is, but um, just increased confidence. These students experienced doing something they didn't think they could do and then came out on the backside feeling like, yeah, I can do that. So those were some of the themes that emerged uh, from my senior students. So where are we going with this? Um, this idea of digital mentorship is not something that comes naturally, okay? The idea of mentorship, for many people doesn't come naturally. And then we stick somebody behind a computer screen and think that that'll be the recipe for having a really robust remote workforce. It doesn't work that way. Um, and so we have got to start cultivating organizations where embedded into professional development is this idea of mentorship in both face-to-face -face and digital contexts. <clears throat> Something that I loved that Robert mentioned earlier was needing a, a new type of digital leadership. And I think he is spot on with that. If you have noticed in remote work everywhere, we try and take what works in the face-to-face -face setting and cram it into online. We fit it into this new box rather than saying, this is a, a new frontier. What is high impact best practices here? the way you mentor someone across the table might be very different from the way you mentor someone over a screen, but that does not negate the importance of both. Um, and so some things I would throw out there as we talk about embedding digital mentorship into professional development and even cultivating this in your classes, right, with students. We have to teach how to do it well. Okay, and this means like rolling up our sleeves, getting in there, doing it with them. Um, I was blown away in reading my students' reflections, how much it is like teaching a kid to ride a bike, which I'm doing right now, and it is next level difficult. Um, there were some speed bumps, like there were some, some conversations where it was uncomfortable, why are we doing this? This is, I shouldn't have to, this is not in the syllabus, all the good stuff, right? Students greatest hits. It took me getting in there with them and lots of, yes, you can do it. Okay, let's, let's break it off piece by piece and talking about what this looks like. Now, one hurdle I had not expected, I think I came into this conversation with a baseline of, well, everybody knows what mentorship is. We're just going to slap digital in front of it and write a research paper. Most of our students, and maybe that we are abnormal in this, most of my students have not experienced mentorship. They would say, I can recognize it when I see it, like I've seen it in movies, but like I don't think I've ever actually experienced someone mentoring me. And so th that took some time to talk through what is mentorship in real life. I would urge you, reflection is kind of my thing. I I'm always using the word reflection, so I'm, I'm going to challenge you guys to do some reflecting this week. Have you ever been mentored? 
it will be very difficult to teach students how to do this well if you yourself have not experienced it. Um, and so that, that is just a question for your drive home later, okay? Um, but teaching mentorship and really teaching anything I think that's new is going to be uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean we don't do it. I would just say about this topic specifically, it's going to require you to get in there and model some of the behaviors that you're trying to see in your students, okay? You may have to be an impromptu mentor for these students. This is not confusing at all. Mentors make mentors who make mentors who make mentors, dot, dot, dot. One interesting thing that comes out of lots of literature about the idea of mentorship in professional contexts is that when you set it in motion, it continues and continues and continues. And so my hope is that these students who have been a part of this project, who have done this thing now, will step into the workforce and recreate some of those behaviors. Because we know that um, employees are more likely to initiate a mentor relationship when they have had a positive mentor-mentee relationship, when they have been a mentee. Um, and so I think a part of this conversation goes back to values as well. Are you in an organization that fosters mentor-mentee relationships? <clears throat> For those who have been in higher ed for the last decade, the idea of mentorship is really sexy, right? Like we, we want that program at our university, but just because we call someone a mentor doesn't necessarily mean they are. Um, and so it's important. We have, to, we have to continue to prioritize it in our organizations. So we've talked at you for a long time and I told you we like conversations. So I have some questions for you. What does excellent remote mentorship look like? Heck, maybe you just tell us what does good mentorship look like? Maybe not even in a digital environment. What comes to mind? I'm great at being quiet until you talk, so. I guess I have had so many fabulous mentors, but all of those relationships started face-to-face -face. Okay. Um, and ended remotely because a lot of those mentors ended up retiring. And so, so this whole idea that my students won't have that experience, that they have a face-to-face -face mentor that just grows into this fabulous person that you're connected to forever. And so I think that's one thing that I worry a little bit about is, are we going to be good at that? You know, a lot of my baby boomer coworkers who have now retired and are living happily ever after, um, they were really good at it. And they took a lot of pride in it. Like, I don't even know how many times somebody would walk up and say, you know, this is my my mentee, Amanda, blah, 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 blah. I don't know as a exennial Gen X-ish kind of human if my generation does that as much or maybe we just haven't started, but it's time to start. It's really okay. time. I agree. It's good. So I have a bit of a unique situation in that I finished my degree while I was in Germany, my bachelor's degree due to a military move. And this was pre-COVID, I finished in 2015. So the person that was my mentor, I'm not sure he had ever done an online class. So he was calling me at my time three in the morning to ask me how things were going. And it was a very interesting experience. And I actually am just officially, I just got accepted to the graduate program for my master's. So it's going to be a really different world. Congratulations. So I'm, I'm interested to see how it works this go around. Yes, yes. Well, best of luck to you. That's very interesting. So you have experienced some of this with the digital component embedded into it. Yes, accidentally, cool. but yes. <laughs> Still counts. It's great. <laughs> Other thoughts? I What's almost going? wonder if all of us would say accidentally. Well, maybe. I don't know that we went looking for this, but here it is. And this is, this is the future. Yeah. I'll just throw my two cents in there that I think that <clears throat> it takes a lot of intention on the part of both parties to execute a yes. good virtual mentor mentee relationship. And I've honestly mailed, made some, you know, failed attempts to be completely transparent at even being a mentee in a virtual relationship. And it's just because 
we get so busy. And then by the time I have an opportunity to catch up with that person, it's like, I'm never going to be able to tell you all the things that have happened within an hour here. And Mm -hmm. now I feel like I'm asking you questions that are way too big in scope for us to really be able to be productive here. So uh, on the other hand, I have another one that I actually do meet once a month with, and we have our meetings at eight o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday. Like we call it coffee talk because Mm -hmm. I know that midweek at 8 a.m., that's about the only time that I really have that I can dedicate, not look at emails for the first hour of the day yeah. to that conversation. So I that to me, I think is and it, it's easier face to face because you see those people. You can say, hey, you have 10 minutes on Friday. Let's go grab a coffee. But mm-hmm. if I'm seeing you once a month, we have to be very intentional about time. Yes. One, one of my students in one of their reflections, and I'm I'm just having this thought as you share that, Brad, so this may come out a discombobulated mess. One of my students made a comment, and I wish I could remember exactly how they said it, but after receiving feedback following giving digital um, feedback critique, um, they said, I, I, that was when I really started seeing those as real people. And in their it sounds terrible, but in their mind, even when it's just a little box on your screen, right? I have no idea where you guys are going after this. I have no idea, you know, what's your vibe, right? Like, what do you, when I walk in the room and you're there, what is that exchange like? Um, We know people who light up the room when they walk in. I know very few people who light up a Zoom room. You do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. But just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not out there and we don't need to work toward it. But I do wonder if on some level, part of why it's harder in a digital context is because it is so easy for you to just be a little two inch box on my screen that I will never think about again. No offense. You guys are lovely. I'm sure you're all listening intently. (laughs) Um, But I mean, it's just, it, it is a little bit easier to kind of Less, less value ascribed to that. Other thoughts? Oh, oh. I really want to hear what they think we should be teaching about remote mentorship. Yes, same. One more thing that I wanted to mention, something that my mentor did that I still implement. When I would tell him I need to talk to you about something, he'd say, okay, do you want to vent? Do you want help brainstorming how to fix it or do you need me to handle something for you and by giving me those options then I could really look at it and say okay is this something I can handle myself is this something I just need to complain about for a minute yeah because it's silly and I don't like it or is this something that is above my pay grade so Mm -hmm. Do you think their intent in asking you that question was to force you to really examine what it was that was going on and kind of predetermine or pre-categorize, okay, this is what, this is what I'm dealing with right now. I think that was definitely a part of it. Um, He, he was one that had been teaching for, I think it was 38 years at the time. And as he put it, he'd been around the rose bush a few too many times to take the time that he needed to be doing things to just listen if we didn't have a plan. So right, right. That's very interesting. I've never heard that before, but I like that. I'm gonna totally use that. I I, I love humans with all my heart. I really do, but I am so introverted and so task oriented that it is so hard for me when. I mean, there's a few people in my life that are allowed to vent to me, but if it's just constant, I, I, I can't. Like, I am sending you all my love, but I can't anymore. That the venting is hard for me. And so I, I am totally going to borrow that. Yeah, that's good. It is good. <laughs> and uh, it, it, if I can put my own two cents in here for a second. Um, what 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 it sounds like your mentor did is he kind of <laughs> figured out a way to uh, take into account emotions during a digital interaction. Like I I I just I think that's unique because that is one of the first things you lose whenever you transition from a physical environment to a digital environment is 
uh, a sentence that you could say in person and that person would be able to tell, oh, okay, he, he's just trying to vent right now. Yeah. Coming across in an email, they could read that as, oh, well, this is a serious problem. I need to drop what I'm doing and work on it. So I I, I think that your mentor's approach is really unique in that it it finds a way to deal with sort of the emotional context that your concerns are taking place in. And that's something we don't often do in digital environments. That's so good, Robert. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. And what a great way to inject that emotion back into the conversation. You're brilliant. I'm glad you let us work with you. <laughs> Okay. Robert is graduating and he's available for a full-time job. So if anybody that knows somebody, I would give him 10,000 stars, all the thumbs up. Likewise. That <laughs> depends on where he wants to work. <laughs> I'm hoping he wants to work in Weatherford, Oklahoma, but I think he's open to remote to all kinds of things. I have another question. I know we have a few more minutes, so I will talk, I will stop talking and let you guys talk. Um, one of the questions we put on the screen is what else should we be teaching students about remote mentorship? And I would just add to that, if there are things in remote work that have made you fall off your proverbial bike, we would love to know about that because those are the types of things that we can turn around then and equip our students to deal with. So what is what should be a part of this conversation that maybe we haven't mentioned so far today? Neurodivergence. Oh, great. Okay. Say, say more about that. How, how might that I, be helpful in this conversation? I am uh, ADHD and most probably autistic as well. Um, and the more, the more I concentrate on a subject, the more difficult it is for me, the more robotic I become. Hmm. So when you all were talking earlier about the feedback, oh, the person is robotic, well, for a lot of individuals who are neuro neurodivergent, if they're genuinely concentrating on something, they'll drop the mask and they will become much more robotic, much more like less likely to uh, make eye contact, things like that. And it's also an issue with the, oh, you have to have your camera on to do this. Well, for a lot of individuals, that's going to seriously mess up their attention span. So, yeah. but I'm, I'm very passionate about that. So I love that you said that. Thank you for sharing that. Because that has to be a part of the conversation too, right? Just like a face-to-face -face interaction is not one size fits all, neither is a digital interaction. And so, yeah, we have to take into account, I think Robert, I mean, I can't remember who it was who said, we have, we have to know who our mentee is, right? Like this is not one size fits all. I love that you said that. That is so good. Other thoughts? I've not been following the chat and I'm sorry, I'm going to. Yes, neurodivergence, exclamation point. I think, you know, something that's been really interesting now that we had masks, we don't have masks, we're back to having facial expression. I am a highly empathetic person. So when I can't see it on your face, like more than anything, I just want someone to tell me, tell me, tell me what's happening because, because then, okay, I, I get it. And so that for me has been really tough the last few years is that I, I tell something is wrong. Like, have, is, are you anxious? Are you depressed? Are you, uh, well, what, what? <laughs> and so I think that helps too, is when people are able to really advocate for themselves and explain, explain why, um, you know, a lot of times I am overly animated and I think that that is very much a learned thing. Like if, if I'm not performing, my face doesn't do all of these things. And so it's obviously masking, right? <laughs> um, if I'm, if I'm just chillaxing, I I'm not, the dimple is not out constantly. And so I think that's important to realize. Yeah, absolutely. Before I wrap up our time, I want to just open up the floor comments questions, stories, knock-knock jokes. Love a good knock-knock joke. I'm curious to hear from anybody if there have been any instances where you may have discontinued a remote mentorship relationship uh, and what those reasons may have been. You know, obviously mm -hmm. I shared 
an example where timing may be an issue. If you can't really meet regularly, it's not going to work out. But I mean, any other things that we should be aware of, I think, in building and kind of making a right pairing, you know, for a mentor mentee relationship in this digital environment. One that happened to me that was kind of heartbreaking is I had a mentor for almost 10 years and then he retired and we kept communicating and kept talking. But a big part of our relationship was him giving me advice. And it felt like two years later, he didn't really know me anymore. Yeah. Right. Because, because he wasn't seeing me regularly and he wasn't seeing where I was going. And so I think that is a hard part of this too, is that if you don't see someone regularly, can you keep up with the differences even in this conversation? Like Jonna sees me in the hallway and she sees that I'm overwhelmed and worn out and blah, 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 blah. But, but I'm never going to show up that way on zoom. Like I, I will hide that every single day and I can do that five or six, seven, eight zoom meetings a day, but I cannot do that walking up and down the hallway to go get more coffee. Like it comes off. Yeah. One of, I'm going to go back to reflection brain for a second. Um, I think a a skill that we don't necessarily equip managers with um, is how to ask good questions. I think when we know how to ask good questions that get to not just the content I'm seeking, but some of the emotion that Robert alluded to earlier, that gives me a really good pulse on where my people are. And so you might be crushing it when it comes to your production or your task completion, but you might be drowning in the process. And so I think the best managers that I have had, and I acknowledge that a manager and a mentor are two very different things. Um, But I think people who take on that role of being a mentor or even being in a managerial role need to understand how to ask good questions. I think that is, is one way I really know the person I'm talking to. When it's all about your quota, I can ask anybody that, right? But there's so much more that goes into capturing the heart behind it. So that's one thing I would throw out into that conversation as well. Okay, uh, you have on your screen uh, my and Dr. Everett's contact information. Despite how brilliant we seem on screen, uh, we actually have a lot to learn um, and are really just kind of, I feel like at the beginning of this journey of understanding what mentorship looks like in a remote context. And so if you have questions or things you'd like to talk about, you wanna buy me a cup of coffee, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding please email us. We would love to continue that conversation. And maybe that looks like helping you with a graduate project. Maybe that looks like uh, presenting at a conference together, doing something with our classes. Um, but we we really enjoy cultivating people who will be really great professionals. And so we know that that takes all of us. So if you would like to continue the conversation, please reach out. We would love that very much. It is 2.48. I think I've let you out early. Out there. <laughs> Dr. Myers and Dr. Everett and Robert, thank you all so much for sharing this story with us, which it really is, I think, <laughs> a story of how you all can maintain mentor and mentee relationships with this digital leadership environment. I've learned a lot here and I've also reflected a lot today, and I really appreciate you all sharing all this information with us. Um, if anybody has any other questions for them, please feel free to ask those now. This is actually the final session that we have for today. So all of the recordings for today's sessions are gonna be available in the platform probably tomorrow once we get in there and are able to trim them, but for the next 30 days, and then we'll post them out there to our webinar archive. But yeah, this was pretty amazing information. And I really hope that everybody took away some good tips here. All right. Well, Dr. Myers, you can actually end the session from your end in Zoom whenever you're ready and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Take care. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Bye.